Imagine if the government could arrest you for your thoughts. Not for what you do, but for what you think. That's what Muslim apostates have to face in countries like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, or Iran, where apostasy, losing your faith in Islam, is a punishable crime. And apostasy is precisely one of the accusations faced by Nikan Khosravi, the guitarist and singer of Confess, an Iranian metal band. But of course, that wasn't the only accusation they had. The Iranian regime also threw accusations of blasphemy, threats to public order, and a whole assortment of nonsense, speech, and thought crimes. For this, Nikan and his bandmate Arash were in prison in Iran for over a year and fled the country just before being sentenced to 12 years in prison and to 75 lashes. All of this for the things they thought and for the things they said in their music. Nikan was kind enough to meet with me for a very interesting conversation about his experiences in Iran and about the incredible oppression that exists against dissidents and free thinkers. It's a conversation that should serve as a reminder about the importance of freedom of speech and of never giving authorities power to control what we can say or what we can think. I am sure that you're gonna enjoy it and find it just as interesting as I did. But before we go into this interview, I wanna let you know that if you want to hear more about Confess and about their music, they are going to release a new album in January of next year and you can already pre-order it from their Bandcamp. They're a good band made up of Iranian and Norwegian musicians who are extremely talented and they deserve your support. If you're into bands in the style of Slipknot or Five Finger Death Punch, you're really gonna love them. So check them out. The Islamic Republic of Iran is a totalitarian theocratic dictatorship. In this country where religion and politics are one, the regime routinely prosecutes and punishes dissidents for the crime of blasphemy. Unsurprisingly, artists and intellectuals are a common target of these persecutions, and today I have the enormous privilege of being joined by one of them. Nikan Kosravi is an Iranian musician and the founder and guitarist of the heavy metal band Confess. It was his participation in this band that made him and his bandmate Arash Ilkhani targets of the Islamic Republic and which, as we will soon discuss, eventually forced them to leave the country. Nikan, thank you so much for taking the time and for joining me today. Sure, man. Thanks for having me. So let's start from the, from the very beginning in this part. You were born in Iran after the revolution. So tell me a little bit, if you can, about what it was like for you to just simply grow up in this environment. The main thing about uh, living in a society like Iran is that uh, based on your belief, it's very important that what is your belief system and how much your family is, uh, you know, conservative or, I mean, religious or, you know, a bit open-minded. My, my family also was like, always very like supportive when it comes to like art and stuff like that and never been forced or encouraged to believe anything specific but at the same time in the society uh it's a uh, that is run by government like that as you mentioned it is is, is a different story I mean, being born in 93 years, it's like a couple of years after the, the war with Iraq. It's, uh, it's, uh, the society is very, um, it's like being recovered and being built up again after eight years of war, the longest war in the 20th century between two countries, which made this a lot of damage in, in, in so many different ways. And me being a child back then, maybe didn't, you know, understand because I was a kid. But uh, the propaganda system in in Iran, like any other, uh, like fascist, you know, political system. Because to me, Iranian regime is a religious fascist. And then, so so propaganda is very important. They want this army of like sacrificials, and they want to build that army, uh, so to speak from the beginning of your childhood, from from school, from even kindergarten. And it really depends on the person uh, that how much uh, it can like be brainwashed by that. It was that I, I never really uh, could believe that what I'm being told about religion and God and all of that and how these guys are being are the representative of, of all of those ideologies on earth never worked out because my family never also, you know, thought like that. And it, it was really cheesy. And for uh, to a lot of people, like the majority, they never fell, uh, like, uh, fell into that trap. But, um, but 
On the other hand, there there are people that uh, since they they really believe in uh, in uh, Islam Shia, they they think that they have to you know it's like they have a purpose in their life, and it's that it's gonna, they gotta keep this system. Was your family uh, religious? I mean, not that they're non-believers or something, especially my mom, but uh, but not that I can say that. Uh, they're religious, never been, and uh, and I mean the good thing was that um, we were like always uh, told that you gotta find out your own way, and uh, there is not any specific religion that you should believe in or something. But be careful outside. Yeah, that's actually what I wanted to ask you about. Sorry for interrupting you there. Um, how was it? Because precisely you mentioned Iran as a kind of fascist religious country and you're absolutely right it is kind of islamic fascism and i'm interested about this contrast right because inside of the house you have this free reign just be whatever you want to be find what makes you happy but outside you don't have that freedom at all so i the republic of iran definitely establishes horrible limitations on freedom of speech and you never know who actually does take the rules seriously so that they could say something to someone that gets you in trouble. So how was it for you to grow up in that environment of knowing that, okay, I think all of these things, but can I tell them to my friend? Because I don't know if he thinks them too. Yeah, one of the things that I remember when we were growing up was that when you're talking in taxi, when you're in taxi and there's like a political political discussion going on, always be careful that what you're saying because you don't know that the person that is sitting next to you or the taxi driver, who is that guy? You know? Who does he know? And what's gonna happen at the end? In a in a in a society like that, uh, you gotta be very careful who you are and how you're representing yourself because you don't know really these guys that are like with you in a society classmates or Uh, neighbors or teachers, so many other people, okay? You don't know really how do they people react, what do they believe, and how far they would go for their beliefs. So, yeah, it is it is a situation that you got to be careful because it can be at least they call you for a couple of questions. I, it's not that it happened like every time, but, yeah, we heard stories that people went through uh, like uh, some – difficulties when they were talking about you know, what's going on with the society and like the political system sucks. Did you always see the regime as dangerous or as an enemy to you or was that something that kind of appeared with age? No, as far as I remember, it was like that because I told you my family also felt like that. I always remember that, for example, when my dad was watching the news and so-called the president is talking, he was like, <laughs> using cuss words when we, when we were, like meet them on the TV because you know that these guys are thieves. You know that these these guys were thieves when they came to power. These guys are thieves while they were staying in power, and until the day they were gone, they're still be they, who they are because this this political system was founded on lies and discrimination and all of this and and, and genocide and all of that. The, the moment that um, you should know Khomeini when he did the revolution in 79, he came to the country with the, with the very different slogans like freedom for all, you know, I'm doing this, I will do that. But the minute that he just basically arrived, he said that, he literally said that I lied to prevail. And it's actually uh, a mentality in, in Islam, Shia, that you can say lie to Uh, it, which it would be like considered as a white lie because you need to prevail your enemies, which they are non-believers and heretics and all of that. So for getting to the power and ruling them, it's okay to tell some lies and like uh, convince them that you're going to actually build up with them. But the minute that you come to power, you basically destroy all of them, which they did. They killed thousands of people that they actually helped them to come to power while they were in jail years after revolution and still doing it to this day. And there's this thing that goes that revolution eats its own children. And it's very true in Iran. And still to this day, you see that the guys are, that have been in power for 30, 35 years and had a very high rank 
position in political system are being sacrificed. Right, it's the only way in which you can maintain absolute or total power for a long period of time, which is to, to kill anybody who gets who potentially threatens your power. I mean, the Russians did it, China did it, Cuba did it, certainly Iran does it. So you mentioned that you were not religious, but I assume in Iran, when you were going to school, you were going to, to schools that were largely religious. I mean, the, the religion is a, an important part of your daily life when you're growing up. Yeah, religion is the maybe the biggest part of our daily lives. And you see it in the books, you see it in educational system, you see it in advertising, you see it in... Sit in the street, the billboards, the metro, taxi, the radio, TV, everywhere. At, at, like nonstop. It's like a brainwashing thing. It's, it's like a big machine that is like trying to wash your brain. And it's hard to get away from it by just the way that you can be like, I do not believe in this. I do not believe in anything that TV tells me. I don't want to watch the news. I don't want to watch the radio, and I will find my sources of finding what's going on around me. In that sense, you are officially, in the eyes of Iran, a Muslim, correct? Yeah, they will see anyone in that country that is born through, if, if your family is not Christian, if your family is not Jewish, if your family is not any other minorities, you're, you're definitely a Muslim, a Shia Muslim. So then that that creates for you an additional challenge, of course, because yeah, in, in, yeah because you would be the, the, punish, the, upon, the punishment for apostasy is yeah. death. Yeah, yeah. So when, when did you realize that that you are in that position that you honestly realize I, I believe or I rather I, I don't believe. And I know that not believing can be extremely dangerous for me because it is not. It was never dangerous for me to say I'm an atheist, right? I never yeah. needed to fear that somebody was going to kill me. Uh, but you do. You did, particularly. Uh, so, so I'm curious about when when you realized that, and and what was that extra motivation that you had? Because, you know, we're talking about how when you were young, you you realized that you need to kind of be careful with what you say so that people don't know exactly what you're thinking. But at some point you did say, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to make music. Uh, this is what I am. This is what I think. I'm going to just put sure. it out there anyway. Yeah. How did that happen? How was that process like? For me, it started with like starting my band, Confess. And I was like, you know, I'm tired. When of, did you like, do that? What? I started the band in 2010. I was like around 17. I remember that at the moment, Maybe I didn't have a fully understanding of what I'm doing because I was just the beginner. I was just a dreamer. I just wanted to start a band and like make some music and talk about serious stuff. I know that these things are dangerous. I know that what I'm going to put myself through, but how deep it is, you got to go and you learn as you go. So me at that time, I was like, I know that one of my main things that I started writing about like, uh, religion and writing about the political status of, 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 of everything that I know is around me was, uh, was that I was tired of pointing out to society and be like, why nobody say anything, you know? So I wanted to basically start from myself. And then the, the other part of your question that when did you notice that you like what you're doing is like this dangerous was the minute that uh, I was arrested. Right, that was in 20, 2015, right? But I, I wanted, I, I want to get to that in a minute. But before that, I forgot to ask you something else that connects to this beginning of Confess. Uh, first of all, how did you get to heavy metal music? The senior high school, one of my friends like gave me a CD and CD and any other type of un stuff that is not related to their education is is forbidden in school at the time. So just put it in the book, just brought it. And I remember that we used to put the the book inside the, for example, this dude brought the book inside of my my backpack and just kind of opened it up and the CD just fell down into another book that I had in my backpack. You see what I mean? So he was like, go check this out. It's a cool thing. And honestly, at the moment, I thought it's, I thought it's porn. Yeah, it was at, at the beginning. I thought it's porn because he was like acting so weird that I was like, "What is this?" You know, I was like, it, "It's it's it's good stuff. Let's just go check it out." And I just remember that I opened my book and saw that he wrote metal with a, like a with a magic marker or something, metal and and 
I was like, okay, I know what metal is. Because at the time, I knew what metal, I knew Metallica, I, I, I knew what Linkin Park, you know. I, I listened to a couple of stuff from, like, my cousin and, like, other friends. But not really focusing on, because at the time, I was listening more than to rap music. I just went home, put it in my PC, and my life just fucking changed right away. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, the first one was uh, Slipknot. They were performing in the uh, live, and Slipknot is really famous for its live performance. I was like, "Holy shit! I don't know anything. You know? I don't want anything. You know? I just want to do this for the rest of my life." And then Slayer and like Pantera and like so many other bands. It was a CD that like for 17, 18 music video that was actually captured from satellite TV and burnt on the CD and you know, there you go, for free. And I was like, holy shit. So then I just asked my mom to give me a guitar and then I, then I just became who I am now. <laughs> you, you mentioned that before metal, you were into rap. Yeah. What kind of rap were you into? And, and even because all of this, particularly back then in the, the 90s and then in the early 2000s, I think that now contraband of information has become easier. But back then, Way easier, yeah. you didn't have that much access to rap or hip hop or you mentioned Linkin Park, for example, yeah. how, how did you get in? How did you even become familiar with all of those uh, bands? Uh, my first experience with music was through my dad. Because my dad was a big Pink Floyd fan. Jimi Hendrix, Tina Turner, so many other artists that he grew up, Alice Cooper and, you know, so he had cassettes. And I remember when we were a kid, he used to play this at home. So I was familiar with the with the sound of like rock music and uh i'm so happy that we grew up listening to good music you know so my 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 ear could pick up this this is good you know i could really feel that okay this music real is reach and and then later on that i just became better in english and all of that uh lyrics was really important for me and that is because of my kind of a rap influence because rap is all about what the guy is saying and uh the rap that i used to listen to at the time it was tupac like lyrical stuff like the stuff that is talking about political and the uh, social status and like the problems and everything so heavy metal, heavy metal uh, the sound that it had was like very moving for me i i used to say and i still saying that Iran is a country that Metal is made for us. You know, metal is made for uh, a young dude in his 14, 13 that is growing up in a society that everything is no, no, no. You can, and they try to decide for you, they try to think for you. Everything is like telling you how to think and like how to be and all that. And metal is, is this escape, metal is this encouraging you to think for yourself to say no at the same time if you want to tell me no and that, and I, i will resist you know so that kind of voice of resistance kind of you know waking the beast in me i guess i was i was quite surprised when i started to look up the com confess music and it was in, in english i mean if you wanted to sound rebellious in iran i think making heavy metal in english would definitely piss them off a lot so why why did you pick specifically to do it like that we didn't want to put any geography uh, like limitation on music uh so we wanted to speak in like english which is like international language and like speak to to the world not just to iran but our thing was that we we wanted to actually uh since to me i'm like a journalist you know Uh, and, and maybe any other musician that is like doing protesting art, protesting music is that way because you're telling the people that are not here what you saw. So it definitely has that kind of like a reporter and like a, your music is like a reportage. So uh, it was important to do that. And the second one was that we are not only singing and writing about Iran. We are, we are talking about if a police brutality not only in iran or also in us so i'm not just talking about iran or it can happen in france it can happen in any in any other country so that that was the main two reasons that we we wanted to start working in english and the third of all is that 
I mean, it's it's my honest opinion, and it's just my opinion. Persian doesn't really fit. Fit. It's not the language that it doesn't have that kind of a kind of a potential to be in a music like as harsh as heavy metal. It's a music of like a po like poems, like classic poems that talk about love and you know, like the classic poets that we had in in Persia centuries ago. So I never felt that this language really fits the the, the sound. So maybe these three reasons. Also, as you said. Uh, the regime in Iran really doesn't like you to have a huge audience because they all they always want to have the main narrative and like tell people that what's going on. You you're you're the you're the stranger. You're the outsider. You're not one of us. It's always their behavior with the people that don't think the same as they do. You were first arrested uh, in 2015 by the Revolutionary Guard of uh, Iran. Um, what was this arrest? Motivated by I've I've seen that it was connected to an album maybe by a couple of songs in particular. Can you give me a little bit of background on those arrests? Uh, the main charges were blasphemy and propaganda against the state through our music. Um, the way I was told later on in the intrications was that I was being followed and like being studied for a year and a half. My phone was tapped. I was under surveillance. They showed me pictures while I was in the street in the interrogations, pointing out to people who is this, who is that, what's your like connection, like making this web to arrest other people. And um, there were like tracks like, uh, because as you said, our second album, Pursuit of Dreams, came out in November of, sorry, 28th of October of uh, 2015, and the 9th of November of the same year, two weeks after, uh, we were arrested. We had so many charges, but it was like under the headlines of category and propaganda and all that. We like they they seized a couple of like frozen a couple of bank accounts because they were like, what you're making money from is haram. It's music that it's satanic and and everything. So. Uh, four songs were the main problem for them. We were basically the biggest problem, you know, but they were trying to find out something to fill the pages with because our case was really fucking thick. I mean, the day that I saw it in court because they just add papers and pictures into it and they built a huge case for you. And Tehel Ron was one of the songs that were like, you know, disturbing the, like, um, the public's view about the city. I was like, I'm just talking about the city that I was born and raised with, and to me, it's very, it's as mellow as it gets. Tehran. It's like, for example, Las Vegas is a sin city. What if I want to give a nickname to my city? It would be Te Tehran, because it's like you see so many like crazy shit there during daytime or especially nighttime. It's like. The drug is around, you can imagine, you know, with any big cities. And, and he was like actually crazy. Because in the chorus, I'd say, good or bad is the hell I raised in and learned to fly. You know, oh. so I'm actually admiring the place that I come from because it, it kind of trained us tough and born us, like, like learned us how to really be a fighter. The other one was I'm your god now. And they actually translated all the lyrics when they came after me. So they knew what they're talking about. I couldn't. Well, they had a problem with artworks that we did. I remember a song that we recorded from the first album was called uh, You Will Pay Back. It had a character in there that uh, it was dressed half in tie and suit and the other half in uh, the Islamic cut. And they were like trying to do this negotiation with the West over the nuclear thing. And you know, like in, in watching was like, these guys are working together. We all know it. Like Western country, European countries don't want these guys to go away because of economy things and like so many other stuff. But uh, another song was Thorn Within, which was the biggest thing because in that song was kind of questioning the God existing. And they were like pointing out that one a lot. And some of the other things like interviewing with like forbidden radio stations to forming a satanic group and 
like very very uh, like diverse charges that at the end they gave us that first six years and then in appeal when we left the country and started to talk again like here and uh, making music again with the same message they they doubled up my sentence to 12 years and a half and they added charges turned into double 12 years and a half and 74 lashes were you surprised that this happened i mean just that that eventually there would be somebody to come to you and say you know this is iran no. and you're doing this thing yeah so no we we knew what we're doing and there wasn't any misunderstanding about what we were doing we knew exactly we are we have activity against the government and we knew what what that means we knew that it can but the, but the, the only thing that actually surprised me was i said it many times here and there that uh that I went strictly to jail. I, my head was that they want to, they will keep me like somewhere and then, like, you know, being tough to you at the end, like giving you a paper to sign, and I'm not going to do the same because at the time I was 21 year old. A 21 year old is old enough to, they will persecute way younger. It's like they, they even execute. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Iran executes children. Yeah. yeah. So you see, so when I told you a couple of questions before was that the minute that I was arrested, I, because now these guys are talking law to you. They're like talking about the law, talking about all that. It's like, okay, so what I'm doing is this big, is this dangerous. You know, you know how it's dangerous, you know, but don't know the explanation for that. Don't know that they, that you do not open a book and be like, oh, if I read this song, it means that it, it this one is that, you know? So when the district attorney, which is the priest, is talking to you, and is that what you say is the post to see? And in that position, you just have like two options. Just do anything to save your life or just be like, okay, I did it. And now we, we choose the second one because I was like, this is what I did. I cannot say that this guy that is in that video is not me. You know, there's no way to do it. And then... At the end, if I say it, they were definitely going to use me for arresting other people. So they were asking names and things. Who do you know? I was like, I don't know anyone. And and um and then I knew that I cannot look at myself in the mirror, even if I get out of the jail. So were you? Because you mentioned that they arrested you, which you kind of expect that could happen. But then you're arrested and you realize they are taking this seriously. I know that eventually you did not face the death penalty as a possibility, but that day you didn't know that that wasn't going to happen. So were you very afraid? Did you think that they were going to kill you? Of course, like any other human being. I mean, these guys are talking to you about they, I mean, you're being intricated for seven hours a day and after two weeks you are in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day for three months and then stay in the other part of the jail for a year and a half of course you're afraid for your life i saw Sorry, how, that, how how long I, did they keep you in jail year and a half you were months. in you were imprisoned for a year and a half yeah and only solitary confinement in three months People couldn't stay at their home because of Corona and quarantine. I was stayed at a, when I was 21 year old in a cell, six quarter meter, for 23 hours a day for three months. Yeah, that's, that's torture. And of course you're thinking about your life, you're like, how, what's going to be the next step? Because from here it's just downhill. It's just going to get worse. Being able to sit here and talk and like turn all of this event, it's uh, very long and movie like a story it, it must be so painful for you as well i mean it, i can't imagine well, no, yeah a, i mean a more but, traumatic experience than this i mean it's horrible. Yeah, it is i mean it's of course is but i just i'm a strong personality because i could figure it out i i saw a 55 year old in jail was crying like a seven year old girl i saw these people i saw people that were tortured i know it was tortured physically but just sort of confinement if it is torture yes but 
I saw like I saw someone that they cut their hair and made them eat it. I saw so many other crazy shit that a human being cannot see. But what should you do? You should move on. And and I learned to to use that as a as a fuel to to move me forward with my life and with my with my music. And it actually, they handed over something precious to me. The pain gives you wisdom. The wisdom enrich you as a as an artist. I use that in my music. I use that in my daily life. It made me a different person. Yes, it was hard. Yes, it was horrible experience. But after that, you can go two ways. You can just sit at like a corner of your room and just be the depressed guy and let them ruin your life. Or after a month, two, three, a year, two, whatever, come back to life and. I tried to do the second one, and so far been, been successful. But it is a uh, it is a very horrible, horrible experience. And you, one of the worst part is that you see there are so many bright people in jail because cartoonists, journalists, filmmakers, and this is the truth, right? But when I say it, they say that no, you're disturbing the. You see? Okay. So we are living in a, like a parallel reality you guys are living in another you are i used to live in another you <laughs> yep, it's, it's the the importance of freedom of expression right because the minute they have any rule that protects anything they they will use that to stop dissident they will stop it to they will use censorship to stop people like you they will use religious offense to stop people like you because particularly in countries like iran the regime and religion are one so criticizing the regime is criticizing religion uh what about your family are they still in in iran yeah they're living there there hasn't been any problem and so, but 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 you cannot go of course not because you are you because that's the part but, of the, bro, the story I would, yeah i mean because you, you have 74 lashes stands there in airport for me and precisely because that, you you to, to put it in order sorry to interrupt you you we we had the first trial you were in prison for a year and a half. There was an appeal, and it was you and Arash Ilkani, your your band member. Both of you were on trial for this. There is a court decision, and that court decision, you appeal it. And yeah. it is during that appeal that you decide correctly to get the fuck out of Iran. Uh, take me back to that moment uh how was it to first get your freedom back after being in prison for a year and a half and second uh when you make the decision i cannot possibly stay here because they're gonna put me in jail i mean for for a long longer period of time for for making music uh the first one was that we bailed out for eighty thousand dollars eighty so eighty thousand dollars at the like beginning of 2017 and then um then the first trial, yes, six years, we appealed. I decided to um, get out. And um, yeah, at the beginning, the process was that, yeah, I'm going to go to court and I'll get my day in the court. And I thought, and I was like in a different, it's like, I've got to get my justice and all of that fucking stupid things. Then I just, six years, you didn't even let me talk. The judge literally told me to shut up. They try to send a message to other artists. It's like this guy, they they, they knew him in, in its own field, outside. It was known inside. Okay, look at him. This is what we're going to do to him. So if you're going to follow the same pattern, this is what you're going to get. And then I just noticed that, okay, so I, it's a puppet show. It's a, they're trying to set an example for other people by sacrificing me. So I just try to go and just keep doing this from outside and just do as much as damage that I can from outside. After the first trial, I was like, disappointed. I was like, okay, I'm not going to get back there, but how can I go? And then my mom was like, I'd be rather you to go, and basically it was like my family that convinced me to go. Yeah, but I, I I decided to go to Turkey. So while I was in Turkey, I asked for asylum there. So you're not gonna get asylum in Turkey, but you gotta live there. So it's kind of permission that you're here until you are being processed through UN. 
for for the, any reasons that you are here. And the, the time that they gave you was four years later, just to go and do an interview that who you are. What you are. So it was a very uh, disappointing experience with UN and all these Refugee agencies, so basically. That basically just get budget from, you know, the mm -hmm. nation and just basically do nothing. Yeah, long queue, all these people. Yeah, I get it. But I saw a lot of other stuff that I don't really want to uh, Yeah, I understand. Talk to. Yeah. But um, while well, I was living there for like a year or so, I received some uh, email from some organizations that introduced themselves as uh, the ones that working with persecuted artists, the ones that they were in danger in their homeland because of publishing what they published and, you know, authors, writers, and, and one of these organizations was the one that actually moved uh, Salman Rushdie after the fatwa that the uh, Khomeini did on his book, Satanic Verses, in 80s. So they were like, we tried to help you with this because we read your interviews in the media and we tried to get as much as help that we can. And I wasn't really, you know, hopeful about the whole thing. I was like, okay, so I just felt some applications sent out. And then a couple of months later, they said that uh, Norway invited you to come here as a guest musician, what they have in their system. It's like a, it's like a political status for the artist with uh, some sort of scholarship. This so, is um, ICORN, right? International Series yeah, of uh, yeah. Refuge Network. Yeah, that's. I, I see that you you are an ambassador. I saw you and I, I almost didn't recognize you because I guess that when you just arrived, you had no beard and you had blonde hair, kind of oh, short. Yeah. So I saw that photo. At first, I didn't realize it was you, but yeah, I've, I've seen it in the in the ICORN website. Yeah, very different. So, uh, so then, uh, yeah, I just arrived in Norway in December of 2018, and, um, and ever since, uh, I'm living, working here, like doing the music also. That's actually where I ended up at the end. I'm curious yeah. about w one experience of your current life, because you are from Iran, and uh, there are many people who don't really see a difference between a Muslim and a person who comes from an area that has a lot of Muslims. Uh, I, not even a lot of Muslims. A lot of, a lot of these idiots think that Hindus are Muslims, so they're not, they're not really smart people. But um, what has that people, experience people been like for like, you? Yeah. The main thing, I was actually talking to another dude the other day about this, and we were laughing. Uh, there is a, there are like a huge group of people that they think that Muslim is a race. <laughs> yeah. You know? So And it operates it, it operates on both ways, I think, in the sense that racists uh talk about Muslims as if they were a race, but at the same time, Muslims sometimes talk about Islam as if it was a race to say that criticizing Islam is the same as criticizing the people. Oh, yeah. I actually want to point it out to the whole since we were, we were talking about Iranian government, it's the same approach from, from both sides because they cannot separate these two from each other. But I mean, I guess in the West is because of the Hollywood and the movies and all of that, the, the media and everything, they basically, after 9-11, they tried to perpetuate this picture that, okay, these people are the enemies and like start that fucking old war between East and West, the whole civilization and it just goes very deep down. That is very, very deeper than 10, 12, 15, 20 years. It's, it goes down in like centuries ago, but it goes into like crusaders and all that. It's still the same thing. It's still the both sides trying to prove something to each other. I never, uh, if we are talking about racism, I've never been into that position that we treated. Uh, and I'm very happy for that. And, and I'm very sad to hear that some other people, different countries, uh, they were treated, felt at least discrimination or had horrible experiences. I never actually felt that way. I never been into the situation like that because also Norway is a country that is very civilized in, when it comes to that thing. And it's a very, it's not as diverse as Germany, it's not as diverse as France maybe because Norway is a big country with a small population, but 
But in here, it's like people can get along. They learn that through educational system. They, they didn't learn how to fight with each other when they go out. So I can uh, I can say that um, my experience was positive, but I cannot prove that it would have been same for other people. It's because of the lack of information that is going on, because not a lot of people really know what's going on in Middle East. They see something, they see other people, they see the refugees that for different reasons come to West and they see them and they, most of them is like cool people or like, okay, I mean, these people are hard workers, these, these people are like very decent and like that way and, uh, and everywhere you can find good and bad people. But of course, when you are being bombed, your house is being bombed, you have to run away, you have to go somewhere. And it's is the story with, with the refugees that were in the war, in the World War II, they had to run away from some, for example, from Germany to Norway, from Norway to Sweden, because it was war, and war is not your problem. I would say it just it also depends on how much you want to use the new opportunity that you get, because of course can can understand the difference between a society like a democratic like Norway and a totalitarian like Iran was that the the talent and the potential that I had would have never been brought out like this that is happening in Norway. And, and and I'm the one that's doing the work. It's not that I'm getting a helping hand at all, no. But the thing is that it's as hard as it could be for anyone, but no one's gonna come at the door and be like, what are you saying in your interview? You know, what, what, what you just told the guy? What you just, what are you doing and all of that? So this, this freedom that you get makes you more focused on what you're doing as a person. And you're not going to be distracted by fear or anything else that, okay, one day I'm going to end up in jail for what I believe. There is a, uh, an Iranian woman, I forgot her name now. Um, she's the, the head of this uh, NGO called My Stealthy Freedom, which is basically about women oh, in yeah, Iran. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. The hijabs. Must and she, yeah. And she was targeted by the regime outside of mm -hmm. Iran, right? So. The regime has done this in the past against uh, critics. Of course, she's fairly famous. She even inspired big demonstrations in Iran. So I understand that the regime is very pissed off at her. But um, as since the moment you left Iran, have you ever been uh, afraid or concerned about what the regime can do to you or to the people who are close to you? Being afraid doesn't help. So I'm not I'm the same as I was in Iran. You know, I mean, it's not a me. It's like I just do it, and then just if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. You know, but yes, I'm very aware of the risk that I'm taking. I'm not under protection of anyway. When I came to Norway, they asked me. It's uh, maybe the first time ever that I said this in any interview. But when I came to Norway, they asked me that do you want any like police protection and all that. I was like, I don't like police, so no, I will handle that. <laughs> I'm my own bodyguard. I don't. I I I, I handle. It. <laughs> but no, honestly. Since you were mentioning before, um, this issue of of a lot of people not knowing what is happening in the in Iran or the Middle East, one of the the things that I didn't like about the way your your story was told at the beginning, uh, and I know that it was done with the best of intentions by the people who covered it, is that they focused a lot on the fact that you were a metal musician, so that it is like, oh, Iran is against metal and they're very religious, um, hiding perhaps the fact that this isn't like the grandparents in a you know twisted sister, sorry, the fa the parents in a twisted sister video. It's not that they just don't like heavy metal. Is that they repress everyone. You could have been making jazz music and they would have fucking put you in jail because of the things that you're saying. So that it is really not just an issue of the regime being just uh, old fashioned or conservative. It is that it's a murderous regime that violates the human rights of its population uh, systematically. That's why when I got the chance to talk, I started to say that I was arrested for my lyrics. Because everyone was like, Heavy metal, you can go to jail or you can be executed in, in Iran for playing heavy metal. I like, no, it's not that. It doesn't really mean that. Because even to this day, I'm answering to this question that how dangerous it is to be a metal band. You know? I'm like, 
And you don't get it. We, we weren't just the first one. We were arrested. But there are so many others out there. It's not the safest thing to do. It's not the most friendliest treat that you're ever going to get for being a metal musician. But I used to be a metal musician for in Iran for five years until I got arrested. So and there and there used to be and there are still so many other bands in Iran. They even get permission to play the music in public because they censor what they say. They don't want them to say certain things. But since we didn't play in that game, we, we were like our own bosses. We were like, we all want to write the music about this. And I just put it out. I don't care how many people are going to listen to it or not. But government. As we were growing up, they were like watching us. So they, they handpicked us. Okay. So it doesn't, as you say, you could be a jazz musician and have an opinion about this. So you could be a filmmaker and have an opinion about this. It's that what you have in your mind and trying to feed, feed like, like as a, as a food, like a brain food to, to people. That's the way that they come to play and try to stop it. I think that that's also another one of the problems, right? And part of this has to do with, with the war on terror, but it happens every time there are these kind of big cultural conflicts or even military conflicts that you imagine that, of course, in our side, we're all different, but on their side, they're all the same. So it is very difficult for a lot of people to imagine that there are kids who wake up when they are 16 in Tehran and say, I don't believe in any of this shit. So they, 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 there is that very um, dangerous idea that people in Iran or people in Pakistan or people in Saudi Arabia, that they all believe the propaganda from the regime so that they think that nobody could possibly be creating metal. Yeah, that's very true. And on our side, I would say an Iranian that's sitting at his home and it's like the conversation, if this conversation comes up, it's like, I hope that there's a sanity going on over there. At least some people don't think that because you're not responsible for the, for if, because it's just very dangerous. And at the same time, uh, as you, as you said, a uh, very, it's kind of a stupid way to see that everyone is the same. If a uh, so-called Muslim, which I had also Muslim friends, of course, because I come from that country, great people like, we were friends since we were kids. They had their own belief system. I had mine respecting each other. I still meet some people that they are like Muslims. I have some idols that they claim that they're Muslims where they were living. Okay. And I do not believe in that. But I respect the guy because I basically respect the persons that believe in something and living for that. I know are willing to die for that. Okay. I love Malcolm X. I love Mohammed Clay, I, I love these guys because these guys are idols of their own peoples and I respect them. But at the same time, I'm just trying to say that if a so-called Muslim will like stab someone in, in, in the streets of London, it's a terrorist act. But if I know a Nazi in New Zealand goes to a mosque and start killing people like his Call of Duty gang, it's a fanatic, is a is extremist. It's like just a terrorist or for people with dark hair. So this trying to put people into frame and labeling and tagging uh, on, on like based on race and look and beliefs and all of that is fascism. And to me, and to me, World War II wasn't ended with with Hitler losing the war. It just became something else. The idea moved out and i guess it started when u.s is starting to bring so many of nazi scientists to the, the brain of nazism into u.s and then it just kind of get got out through the media because these people are starting to controlling media building the media building the science and so many other things what i'm saying i understand is very controversial but i believe in that and and there are so many ways to prove it because I mean, in the, in the case of the United States, what I would what I would say is that they they've uh, they're they're an empire and certainly they they put out propaganda. We, we might we can debate as to the reasons why they put out propaganda. But from the no, movies I, that I you watch and everything, you see that it is created to create a positive image of what the empire does. I mean, if you, even if you think about something like 
from when you were growing up, something like the TV show 24. Uh, Jack Bauer, you know, it's 24. Like, the dude, the motherfucker committed war crimes nonstop. He was torturing people all the time. And it was produced at a time when the United States was trying to justify torturing prisoners in its wars of aggressions in the Middle East, right? So, so you yeah. can see that the United States absolutely pushes that that kind of nonsense. And you're absolutely correct in, in what you say about uh, that this fascism comes from... from uh, qualifying people by, by the category they belong to, right? So you, your rights are going to be less now because, well, you, you happen to be a Muslim or you happen to be black or you happen to be an immigrant. Um, and in fact, one of the things that are happening now in the United States uh, as a result of the investigations that came after what happened in January at the Capitol has been that now a lot of uh, right-wing Americans are getting to experience what uh, Muslim Americans got to live for the last 20 years, which is to have, uh, you know, their their uh, churches spied upon, their phones tapped, and the FBI treat them like terrorists. I, th I, I am a very anti-religious uh, person. I consider that religion is, uh, all religions are versions of the same uh, essential untruth. Uh, but I also believe that everybody has the right to believe whatever nonsense uh, they want. Yes, and uh, yeah, it's not it's not my right to, you know, to just, because if I do, then I would be exactly like my own enemies. Exactly, um, yeah. You have the right to pray how many times a day you want, but you cannot force me to believe that first you're right, second, I have to do the same thing and also teach other people and have the right to question their own beliefs. No, it's not like that. We have to learn once and for all to live right next to each other in peace. And I don't think that that would, ever happen perfectly but at least we can try to mimic <laughs> the whole thing i i think that a part of the world has kind of moved away uh, from time to time it, it gets better like we have less uh at least in the west we have less single ideologies controlling uh, people so something like nazism or fascism doesn't exist as a single ideology so that's a positive development uh, but we still have a lot of people who either for religion or politics thinks that they did find the right answer for all of humanity and they want to impose it on the rest of us. And regardless of whether they are atheists, Christians, Muslims, Hindus or Jews, uh, those are the people that have to be combated. And those are exactly the people that you combated very bravely in uh, Iran. And I admire you tremendously for uh, what you did, man. I mean, really, uh, it takes a lot of uh, guts and it takes a lot of bravery and it takes a lot of principles to to face a machinery like the machinery of the theocratic uh, and repressive Islamic Republic of Iran. And uh, I cannot thank you enough for having given me the so much time today uh, to speak with you. Man. You're very admirable and you should be very proud of yourself and your family should be very proud of what you've done. Wow.